The Leicester Balloon Riot. POV, it's 1864 and you're an English laborer in the Sea of Leicester. Well, there's really nothing fun to do because it's 1864, but you read in the paper that famed aeronaut Henry Tracy Coxbow is coming to town to put on a show with his famous balloon. So of course you and 50,000 other people had to go see it. So at the event itself, there were just eight police officers and a small fence to separate Coxbow and his balloon from the crowd. And why was that a problem you may ask? Well, a random drunk in the crowd claimed to be an aeronaut himself, and confidently claimed that Coxwell's balloon was in fact not his biggest balloon. Well, the crowd enraged by only getting to see a subpar balloon, knocked down the barrier and surrounded Coxwell and his balloon, and started heckling the man and demanding he take off. Problem was, he could not take off now because of the huge mob impeding him. But things really went down the toilet when a police officer panicked and hit a woman with a baton, sending her to the ground bleeding. Well, some things never change. This had the effect on the crowd of sending them into a rage, tearing and burning down the balloon. Coxwell had to take refuge in a local clerk's house. Meanwhile, the crowd then paraded whatever remained of the balloon throughout the town. At least for Coxwell, public opinion sided with him after things calmed down, with a London newspaper describing the crowd as a horde of savages as fierce and untamed as the South Sea Islanders, and differing very little from except their habitat, a very racist way to put it, but that gives you a good sense of the public's opinion. In response, the Lesterers put the blame on the agitators from the city of Nottingham. The mayor also felt bad and started a fundraiser for Coxwell to get him a new balloon, but only raised about 500 pounds. The Toronto Clown and Firefighter Riot Now, Canadian clowns aren't usually the type you'd think would start a riot, but in 1850s Toronto, that's something that actually did happen. See, the circus came into town, and after a hard day's work, a gaggle of clowns hopped on over to the local brothel. Well, they get there, and they see that there was a group of firefighters already there. See, in those days, firefighters had to be extra tough, since firefighting followed a structure of private companies who would rush to the scene of a fire, and whoever got there first got dibs. Problem was, if two companies got there at the same time, they would just have to fight each other over it, and the winner got to put out the fire. So I guess the firefighters were upset about a bunch of clowns crossing their turf. So they started arguing until someone swung a punch, and the entire place erupted into a brawl. Well, things escalated with the clowns beating up some firefighter ass, and then the firefighters having to retreat. So the clowns got to, well, you know what, in peace. Well, at the time, Toronto's mayor, along with most of the city council, were a part of a group called the Orange Men, which the firefighters were friends with. Now, usually the Orange Men just focused on beating up Catholics, but they were willing to make the occasional exceptions. So, an orange mob gathered outside the circus's campsite, and the chief of police and mayor, being Orange Men, dragged their feet on sending officers to stop the whole thing. But by the time any officers arrived, full-scale fighting had already broken out, and most of the circus was running for their lives, with eventually the mayor having to intervene and send in the local militia to stop the mob from chasing the circus out of town, which, after collecting their things, hightailed it out of there anyways. The New York Doctors' Riot Back in the 1780s, about a fifth of New York's population was black. Now, because racism, when they died, their bodies would not be buried within city limits, and instead on a plot near Chamber Street, which was also located near the Medical School of Columbia University. Now, of course, there is one thing medical schools need, cadavers for dissections. Problem was, in that time, operating on corpses was a big no-no. So the university's solution? Grave robbing. But eventually, a group of freedmen did notice some students digging up a body late at night, and brought up their concerns to the local council, who of course could do nothing about it because racism. But on one day in April 1780, Professor Richard Bailey and a student were performing a dissection on an arm when the student saw some kids playing outside. So this student must have had a really dark sense of humor because he took the arm and waved it at the kids and told them that it was their dead mother's arm. Jesus Christ, dude. Well, the kids were rightfully mortified and went and told their dad, who then exhumed his wife's grave and found the body missing. So he gathers a group of concerned citizens and they gather around the university's hospital. The crowd eventually grew larger and rowdier and broke into the hospital. Richard Bailey and his students ended up having to run to the police for protection. But the mob seeing the dissection scenes in the hospital marched down to the city hall demanding Richard Bailey be brought to justice and swelled to over 2,000 people. Large-scale rioting broke out and eventually the governor had to call on the militia to put things down. After the crowd dispersed, it was estimated that up to 20 people died in the whole thing. Thanks for patrons Andy Luke, Emerson Salmario Rubio, Link the Bets 24, Skylar Weston, Sean Fenerty Loins, and Zyma.